say that at this time of the year because this is what it means it's Christmas time the birth of our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ amen amen, amen. all right this will be our last uh, message on this means war we just didn't play the the trailer but um, we want to kind of a little bit of a Christmas seat but you know we already talked about the fact that you know, Christmas in and of itself, the birth of Christ, actually means that there's a war going on between the enemy and the Lord God himself. And so today I want to talk about the last part of this means war, which is God's love personified. I, I don't know if, how many have ever read the Bible all the way through? And how many of you kind of see God's love all the way through it? I know sometimes in the Old Testament it's hard to see God. Everybody looks at God, he's kind of angry and he destroys people or whatever, but it's only because he's a jealous God. And he loves us. And this manger that we're going to talk about today is a personification of God's love. Isn't this a beautiful set? Amen. Couldn't be more appropriate. So what I want to do today is I want to give you a unique view of the Christmas story. We're going to read through it. It is God's love in the greatest force. God's love is the greatest force to fight the enemy in our lives and in our world. Just imagine this. He came to this earth like one of us to save every one of us. He came to this world like one of us to save each and every one of us. Wow. Do you remember when I was preaching the last time a few weeks ago, I was talking about, um, you know, the um, rules of engagement? And one of the rules is that we need to see the bigger picture. And so what I want to do is I want to show you God's bigger picture of the story of Christmas. One of the greatest human dilemmas that we have in our society today, and every one of us included, is that we tend to see things through a narrow perspective. We only have our little perspective on how to view things, whether it be theological or political or just whatever it is that we believe or we have a bias towards. Everything is kind of narrowed down. And it's really hard to see the bigger picture if you are focused so much on just one angle of something. But you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that what you see is a part of a larger picture in this world. You are only seeing a narrow focus. When we look at the manger, we see one dimension. We see one part of the Christmas story. What I want to do is I want to show you the bigger picture. Even though it seems that the enemy wins some of the battles that we have in our, in our world today, God inevitably will win the war for us. Yet it may seem like during this Christmas season that the enemy is winning some of these little battles in our lives. But I am here to tell you that God is going to win the war. He, we, we are going to have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that victory was personified when a baby erupted on the scene in the darkness of this world. But I want to talk to you about the manger. But first, I want to talk to you about the bigger picture of his love and victory. And the first thing I want to talk about is the garden mandate. Because I don't know how many of you know that where we are today in celebrating Christ's birth is because of the Garden of Eden. You know, Adam and Eve were created in his image and his likeness. And they were supposed to stay in the garden. Folks, i got to tell you something. We're not supposed to be here on this world here. We were supposed to be in the garden. And Adam and Eve kind of messed that up for us a little bit. So that's why we have to have a war against the enemy. Because the serpent decided he didn't like the creation of God. And so he allowed them. He went and tried to deceive, and, and it worked. And they ended up eating of the fruit. All right? And so when they did that... There had to be a curse. But guess what? God came and he presented a curse to Adam and to Eve. But something that is a little obscure is the garden mandate, which, I, which is basically Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. God 
presented a curse to the serpent. And it says this, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all the animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And here's what God said to the serpent. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Do you know that after Adam and Eve fell, God's plan was to repair the damage? And that repair in this context was predicting Christ was going to come. Now, I was reading and in, in studying this, and it was kind of interesting because one commentator says, you know, snakes kind of walk, they walk, they slither on the ground, right? And, and, and one commentator is putting it this way, that you're walking along the ground, and all of a sudden a snake bites you in the heel. You will strike his heel. But then our instinct is to what? Stomp him. And it's kind of the picture of what God said to the serpent. You might strike his heel, but he will stomp your head. And so the garden mandate says to me that part of the Christmas story started right after the fall. That is God's love personified. But then we go to Jesus' incredible sacrifice. Here is Jesus. He is sitting at the right hand. He is there with creation. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. And even God said, Let us make man in our image. So Jesus was there at the creation. And one of the most amazing things, when Jesus himself three times said this in different ways, no one has ever come, John 3, 13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who what? Came from heaven. Isn't that, an, wasn't that a beautiful song? Came from heaven. John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And John 6, 51 says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Wow. I just want you to kind of imagine something for a minute. Jesus himself, who is a creator of this universe, with his Father, agreed to come down to this world and fit in a womb for nine months and then live a life of a baby and a child and to grow up like we do. Can you just think about that for a minute? If somebody came to you and says, I want you to give up everything you've got and I want you to live in this refrigerator for nine months. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing to me that he didn't just appear. Isn't that fascinating? Because God could have done anything. He could have come right here. Jesus, you're going to this earth right now. Boom, he's here. And he just kind of walks out of nowhere. But there was a purpose. There was a glory that was going to come out of it because Jesus himself wanted to experience what we experience. Right from the very beginning, we have the God of this universe that wanted to experience what we experience. Isn't that neat? Think of this. When we think of Christ, we think of his sinless life, his miracles, his love, his death and resurrection, him sitting at the right hand of God. But what about the God of this universe coming from where he resides to fit in the womb and become a baby? What an incredible sacrifice that Christ made. Well, then we have the willing vessel. The willing vessel that God had to have in the bigger picture of bringing Jesus to this earth. And in Luke chapter 1, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. 
You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. And I love these words. For no word from God will ever fail. When God speaks it, it will come to pass. In the Amplified, verse 37 says this, For with God nothing is impossible, and no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. <laughs> Folks, when we look at the narrow picture, and Mary comes on the scene, and she is a virgin, and you are going to give birth to a child, what? <laughs> Can you imagine that? I mean, it, it is incredibly powerful to me. But God says, I can do anything and I am going to do everything. If you just focus on the little picture, you won't see it. So expand your mind. First, we have the garden mandate. We have Jesus coming out of heaven. We have a willing participant or a willing vessel in Mary. Next, we have the hesitant participant. And in Matthew chapter 1, 19 to 21, it says, Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You see, even God is able to take doubts and clear them up. And he knew it. You have to know that. When Mary goes to Joseph and says, hey, I'm going to be pregnant. <laughs> what? Now, it's, now shame comes on the scene. And God knew that was going to happen, created doubt. So what did he do? He sent an angel, the bigger picture of God's love, to make sure that every single event happened just the way it was supposed to be. Folks, I'm here to tell you, don't focus on those little things in your life and get discouraged. We need to look up and look at the bigger picture and focus on what God could be doing in our lives. And when you think of Christmas, and when you are home unwrapping gifts, and you are having Christmas get-togethers, get think about the bigger picture of God's love. His plan was going forward. So how do you get, all right now, Jesus, how do we get you to Bethlehem? Hmm. So in Luke chapter 2, we have the census, don't we? And again, follow me because there is a bigger picture going on here. It says this, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. <laughs> so God had to get them to Bethlehem. And how did he do it? He said to the governor, we need a census. And, and if you think about this here, it isn't just a short distance, because when I was doing research on this, it was really kind of powerful to think, because it was almost like God was purposely funneling everything to one place. Because when you, when you look at the geographical distance between where they were and where they had to be, it was about 80 to 90 miles. This was no short trek. And somebody in our team meeting figured that 
it would be like walking from Dover to Philadelphia. And you didn't have an automobile. You had to walk. One theologian said that it probably took about three days. In three days, wow, Mary was pregnant. And, and to combat, uh, combat that a little bit, Bethlehem is 700 feet higher than Nazareth. So not only were they going 80 miles, but they had to continually go uphill. But God had to get them there. See, God doesn't do things the easy way. It may be easy to him, but he gives us the power and strength to accomplish that. It's kind of neat, isn't it? But now we have him funneling it completely down because here come Mary and Joseph looking for a place to stay. And they found no room in the inn. Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, it says, While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Folks, you know, Dorothy was kind of wondering, I wonder what that might have looked like. How many times do we see it depicted? Do you see it depicted behind me? All right, so I want to ask you here, how many have ever seen the movie The Star? In other words, how many have kids <laughs> or grandkids? And you have to watch the movie The Star over and over and over and over again. It's interesting. The word manger is, means feeding trough. So a manger, Jesus was put in a feeding trough, a trough that has a feed, a hay or whatever it is for animals. Can you imagine God's humility to rest in a feeding trough? But then I was doing some research. I said, what is the real manger? What does it really look like? And of course, nobody has Polaroid pictures because there was nothing taken back then. But you know, when, when I look at it, there were two specific theories about what the manger scene was all about. And the first one I find interesting is that uh, some theologians believe that it was a cave. So you have to kind of erase all of what you see here and just imagine Bethlehem in a, and, and they came to a cave. And if they came to a cave, then it's probably a mason trough, okay? Something made of masonry to feed animals. That's where people would keep their animals. I don't know if you know this, but back then there were no cars. <laughs> so the garages there were caves to put their animals in. And they had feeding troughs. It's a very simple setup. But when I look at that, it's kind of interesting that if we believe that and we see that could be true, isn't it interesting that he was born in a cave and he was resurrected out of a cave? You want to talk about God's love. He's pretty consistent in what he communicates, isn't he? There's uh, several other theories. One of them being that they were going from place to place looking for, you know, from a guest house, they were looking for some. And in these dwellings, there were two stories. On the top story, there was the living quarters. On the bottom story was where the animals were, basically the garage for their animals and a feeding trough. And that Mary and Joseph found one of those places because there was no room in the residences, but they were in a under, just kind of the bottom floor of that. Just think of that for a minute. Jesus possibly was born in the presence of other animals, downstairs of a resident, quite possibly in the presence of those animals. God's funnel to a simple manger, the great king in a simple, lowly place, just for you and me. That is God's great love, isn't it? But the last thing I want to talk about is the invitation. Because the Bible indicates that he sent invitations out to the kings, to the pharaohs, to the mayors and the governors and important dignitaries to come and see this wonderful thing. Now, don't let me sit with that. That's not what happened, is it? 
No. There were no great invitations that was said, hey, come to the manger. Come to see what happened. But the angels came to shepherds. The great shepherd of this world, the first introduction was to shepherds. It's like, isn't that typically God's way? There were no distortions or doubts or agendas, just simple minds seeking a simple but profound event. And so God says this in Luke 2, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I will bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those in whom God's favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. He wanted a pure message. God wanted a pure message. And what better way than the Lamb of God to be witnessed by shepherds? The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of this world is born in Bethlehem, and he wanted shepherds to be the first one to see it. Nobody with with an open agenda, nobody with Facebook and Twitter accounts to spread the word. It was going to be a simple crash into this world that not too many people would see. But it would become the most powerful event in human history. Jesus himself coming out of heaven into this child lying in a feeding trough with Mary and Joseph because there was no other room. Wow. Do you see God's bigger picture of his love? The shepherds got to witness the simplicity of the manger. And Luke 2.12, just to kind of bring that back up, says this. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am, the one who created us, is in a baby, bound by cloths, lying in a feeding trough. No majesty, only humility. No fanfare, only simple silence. No warrior, only a servant. He found a simple way to reside in our simple lives and hearts. He did not want to make it complicated. God's love is not complicated. It has no agendas attached to it. It is unconditional. Everyone is included. He did this just for you and me. A simple, simple gesture of God's great love. Can you feel the goosebumps inside? At this time in Christmas, when we go through this week, Don't look at the Christmas lights and the presents and the joy on your children's and grandkids' faces and the dinner that you will eat and the family that you will visit. Or perhaps maybe you don't have anything and maybe Christmas means something to you that's a little bit less happy. But I guarantee you the message of Christ's love became personified in a simple scene. Mary and Joseph. Amen? Amen. I just want you to think of it. It's a solemn message just to contemplate God's great love personified to us in a manger. Let's stand today.
Hallelujah. Lord, we're just thankful for this time here today. It's a very simple retelling of a story, but in maybe a little bit of an expanded edition, because when we look at the implication of how you loved us so much that you started when Adam and Eve fell and you funneled every bit of your love into a manger. Now this baby is going to grow and live a sinless life and perform many miracles. He will be accused of doing things he didn't do. He will go on trial and not say a word. He will hang on the cross and he will die a horrible death. He will shed his blood for us. But what happens in that cave, in that tomb, is the culmination of the entire work when he comes out and he's resurrected for us. His blood shed for us. His body broken for us. Started in a simple manger. Lord, I pray that you burn that home in our hearts. That we could look at Christmas in a different way. We just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity here today to just marvel at what you did in a very simplistic way because you wanted us, very simple people, to come. Just the shepherds. Lord, I pray that you would just be with us through this Christmas season. I know that there are many people traveling right now, and there are many continue that will be traveling. Lord, I pray for your church, Lord, that you would watch over everyone that is traveling, bring them home safely. But Lord, may we have just a great Christmas season and a great new year. And we honor you today. Thank you for this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.